You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Love Cast at savage.love. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Love Cast. I'm going to take Marjorie Taylor Greene's bait because I never could resist a butt plug. I have some sentimental feelings about them, actually, because a butt plug played a significant role in the Dan and Terry love story. The first gift I ever got, Terry, this horny young twink who loved getting fucked, the first gift I ever got him was a butt plug. And it didn't go over well. He was actually kind of appalled and more than a little annoyed. I guess it wasn't what he expected as a birthday gift from his brand new boyfriend of all of six weeks. And his annoyance may have had something to do with me putting that plug in a fancy box and wrapping it nicely and then letting him open it, sitting in a booth in the bar where we met, surrounded by his closest friends. You know, he was actually kind of pissed. Like someone once said, the course of true love ne'er did run smooth. In retrospect, of course, I can see why what I did wasn't okay. It wasn't okay. In the moment at that stage of my emotional development, I thought it was funny. We'd been having sex for a few weeks and six weeks and all of his friends at the party were gay. And based on the data I'd collected on Terry up to that point, I was like, you would love butt plugs. And Terry was like, sex toys, ew, gross. I would never, I'm not that kind of boy. And I was like, that's what all the boys say until you get a butt plug in them for the first time. Luckily for me, Terry's friends were like, dude, you're dating a notoriously perverted sex advice columnist. What did you expect him to get you for your birthday? Socks? The plug stayed in the box in my apartment for a few days, and then it wasn't in the box anymore. It was in the boyfriend, and all was forgiven. This little walk down butt plug memory lane was inspired by Marjorie Taylor Greene, of all people, who told a gathering of young Republicans in New York City over the weekend that they could all go out and buy butt plugs at CVS, the drugstores that are literally on every other corner in Manhattan. Here's the audio. By the way, you can pick up a butt plug or a dildo at Target and CVS nowadays. I don't even know how we got here. (laughs) So it's not just butt plugs at CVS, it's butt plugs and dildos at CVS and Target. After Marjorie Taylor Greene asks how we got here, someone in the audience, one of the young Republicans gathered in the room, famously young Republicans like Rudy Giuliani, one of them says, gay marriage. They would like us to believe that there's a direct line from gay marriage to dildos at Target. For the record, gay marriage was first legalized in the Netherlands in 2001. It's been legal in all 50 states. Here, since 2015, the oldest known dildos on the planet predate gay marriage by almost 30,000 years. I don't think Green is shocked by dildos or butt plugs. I don't think Green is any stranger to sex toys. She's reportedly had multiple affairs, a polyamorous tantric sex guru, a personal trainer, reports she hasn't denied exactly, but hasn't confirmed either. And in what could be a coincidence, Green's husband of 27 years recently filed for divorce. Seems to me that someone who's had at least two affairs, reportedly, allegedly, neither confirmedly nor deniedly, odds are that person has laid eyes on and laid hole on a sex toy or two. That butt plug at the meeting of young Republicans in New York, it was strategically deployed It was there to distract us from the other things that were said at that party, at that Don't Say Gala. Some of the other things Green said and some of the other things said by other speakers. Green had this to say later about January 6th. If Steve Bannon and I had organized that, we would have won. Not to mention, we would have been armed. By one, of course, Green means she would have stopped the peaceful transfer of power, which, of course, the insurrectionists did on January 6th. We had a transfer of power at the end of the day, but for the first time in American history, it wasn't peaceful. Green's comments about butt plugs went viral. Her comment about armed insurrection, her support for it, didn't get nearly as much attention by design. 
And then there was what Gavin Wax, president of the New York Young Republicans Club, had to say during the event. And I quote, We want to cross the Rubicon. We want total war. We must be prepared to do battle in every arena, in the media, in the courtroom, at the ballot box, and in the streets. Total war. Where have we heard that expression before? That term, that expression, that was coined by the Nazi minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, in a famous speech he gave when the war in Europe started turning against the Nazis. Hopefully that's a good omen. The Nazis only started to talk about total war when they started to feel like they were losing. Maybe Republicans are, after the midterm, starting to feel like they're losing too. But its use, total war, wasn't an accident or a coincidence. This expression is instantly recognizable to anyone who studied the Nazis in the Second World War and just as instantly recognizable to anyone who is a Nazi right now. Total war. So Tallinn Craig, they don't care about the butt plugs for sale at Target or CVS. You can also get condoms and lube at Target and CVS. And for the kinksters, saran wrap and duct tape and clothespins. They also don't care about the fetish wear for sale at Walmart, where you can order the Medusa, a one-piece crotchless black fetish body stocking for women, $39.48. Or at Amazon, where you can order an 11-piece bondage for sex kit, for thirty ninety nine, you can order that bondage for sex kit, but you shouldn't because at thirty ninety nine, that's all going to be crap. They don't care, but they want you to think they care about butt plugs. They want you to think they're coming for your sex toys or your drag queens. When what they're coming for is you, you and your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers and your lovers, you and your democracy. They're talking about butt plugs because they don't want us taking them literally or seriously. They want us laughing at them. They want us to think they're ridiculous and harmless because those two things usually go together, ridiculous and harmless. They don't in this case. They don't in the case of the Republican Party right now. They don't in the case of Marjorie Taylor Greene and the crowd of young fascists who gathered in New York this weekend. They are ridiculous, but they are dangerous. And they're deadly serious. Not about butt plugs, but about seizing power. All right, before we start the show, a quick thank you to everyone in Georgia who knocked on doors, got out the vote, stood in lines, voted, and helped reelect Raphael Warnock. Thank you. And this will seem random, but it isn't. Some of you will know what I'm referring to. People shouldn't steal other people's luggage from baggage claim carousels at airports. There is no excuse for that. Oh, in the finale of White Lotus season two, if you haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil it and I'm not going to spoil it. What I'm about to say is not a spoiler, but if you don't want to hear anything about the finale, skip ahead. All right. I just wanted to second, second and endorse and signal boost everything Daphne had to say to Ethan on the beach. All right, coming up on the micro Savage Lovecast, tons of listener Q, lots of host A, and on the Magnum Savage Lovecast that you can subscribe to at savage.love, Erica Moen returns with some sex toy recommendations for curvy girls, and together, Erica and I learn about a brand new miracle sex toy they're calling cock rings. Apparently, they're rings that go around your cock. Become a Magnum sub to hear the entire Savage Lovecast again at savage.love. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Foria. Foria crafts 100% all-natural sexual wellness products so you can experience deeper intimacy and transcendent moments of sexual pleasure solo or with your partner or partners. Get 20% off your first order by visiting foriawellness.com slash savage. That's F-O-R-I-A wellness.com forward slash savage. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. Get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. This episode is brought to you by Helix Sleep, the best mattress for your individualized comfort. Right now, my listeners get up to $200 off all mattress orders at helixsleep.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. Gay guy, mid-30s here, calling from San Francisco. 
I'm curious to know your take on this situation, on whether or not I ghosted someone or not. So I guess the story is I had met someone on like a phone line. We had this really fun 30 exchange going on for about a week, but there were some things that felt like a little red flagish and were just not really sitting right with me. And so I was going to call him and say, Hey, like, I don't think we should stay in touch anymore. And I think you deserve better than I can presently offer. Also because I'm in the kind of a complicated situation just trying to reconcile some things just in my life and relationships with other people in general. I went to call him, went to voicemail, but the voicemail was full. So I then just sent a text message saying like, Hey, I think you're a nice guy, but you know, I can't give you everything you're looking for. So I don't think we should really stay in touch and maybe you should consider looking elsewhere. Um, and then afterwards, kind of blocks the number just to, you know, reinforce kind of the no contact thing. Did I just ghost? I mean, I'm trying to be a more considerate person and communicate what I'm feeling. Um, I think I was just thrown off in the situation because the voice is full. So I'm curious to know what you or others would think. Ghosting is disappearing without a trace. You didn't ghost. You sent this guy a message. You sent him a text message and let him know you wouldn't be seeing him anymore exchanging messages with him anymore. It had only been a week. He didn't deserve, it didn't have a right to a face-to-face breakup or even a phone conversation necessarily after a week's worth of swapping messages or maybe jumping on the phone, a week's worth of contact that left you feeling not great about this guy, not safe meeting up with this guy. You say there were red flags. And I think it's interesting, and it speaks well of you. You seem like a hyper-conscientious, considerate individual that, you know, you called him and you made excuses that would allow him to save face or allow him to sidestep, avoid scrutinizing his own behavior, wondering what he might have done or said wrong. I don't think you should have necessarily called him and said, look, here are the red flags. I am uncomfortable meeting up with you or continuing to be in any contact with you whatsoever for these reasons, I think you just could have like said, hey, not feeling it, moving on, goodbye, and then blocked him. But instead, you did this thing that so many of us do, where you told him that he deserves better than you, not you were worried or freaked out by him, but he deserves better than you, someone who's a better fit for him than you could be. I guess that's someone who's colorblind, who can't tell what color those flags are. And then you said you already have a lot of people in your life and you're juggling a lot of relationships and you just essentially don't have the emotional bandwidth that being in relationship with him would require, which just brings us back to he deserves someone better, more emotionally available than you are at this moment. And, you know, those are the little white lies we tell when we break something off with somebody. And I think all of us need to set those aside not give those little white lies the benefit of the doubt and scrutinize our own behavior in the result of a breakup and maybe check in with friends, maybe friends we'd been confiding in along the way to see if we weren't doing something wrong, to see if we ourselves weren't waving red flags around over our heads or doing things that may not have been red flags for an abuser, but may have been, you know, the kind of behaviors that people watch out for because they're so strongly correlated or associated with abusers. So, uh, that was just me giving a little speech. Suffice to say, caller, you did everything right. And by no one's definition, does a voicemail or a voicemail attempt in good faith and then a text message equal ghosting? Ghosting is disappearing mid-conversation. Ghosting is making plans and then not showing up and not responding to any text messages about why you didn't show up. That kind of disappearing act is what people are referring to when they talk about ghosting. What you did, you didn't disappear. You let them know you wouldn't be seeing him anymore or texting with him anymore And then you drove that point home by blocking him. You didn't ghost. You did, in fact, almost everything right. Hi, Dan. I am a woman living in the Pacific Northwest in my late 30s. I'm married for just over a year. And this question today is, it's more of a concern that relating to 
my husband and how he has recently started drinking a lot more. For context, I wanted to let you know that over the past few years, my sisters and I have watched our father slowly sink into very tragic alcoholism after it got really bad after our mom died in 2019. But um, he's been hospitalized for pancreatitis. He's tried to hide it from us. He's been through a lot. And my husband has been aware of this, our entire relationship. In the past two months, he has gotten absolutely trashed on multiple occasions, usually alone in our basement. And he will try to hide it from me. He'll come upstairs and be slurring his words and his eyes are half closed and he's really droopy and clingy. And I'm just, I've confronted him. I'm like, you're trashed right now. And he has dismissed it, denied it, laughed it off, been like super gaslighting me. Just like, no, I'm not. I had a drink, whatever. But now I'm pregnant. I'm, I'm 12 weeks pregnant and we're going to have a child. And I have expressed to him that uh, like, I will not raise a child in a home with an alcoholic or um, even someone with just a drinking problem. I, before I was pregnant, drank occasionally socially. I like wine and cider, you know, but now I'm afraid to even have anything in the house. I had a couple bottles of wine recently for a girl's night where, you know, the non-pregnant people were to drink. And he, as soon as everyone left, you know, by the next day, he had drained everything. He's got bottles and cans in the basement and I, I can see it. He's, if he's hiding it, he's not hiding it very well, but the beer never hits our fridge. He must have it in the garage or he just buys it and keeps it in his car, which I think is a red flag. I think that that is definitely indicative of a problem and it's behavior that I've seen before and feel very triggered by. I, I want to talk to him about this. I want to have a serious coming to Jesus and I also want to know where I can draw the line. How far is too far? Like, I, I don't want to just abruptly end our marriage without giving him a chance. But at the same time, I've brought it up before and he's dismissed it. And then these events are happening more frequently. And now we're having a baby. Any any advice is is welcome. I, I, again, I really don't want to divorce my husband over this, but I, I cannot, I cannot live with an alcoholic again. Move out, move out now, moving out with the help of your sisters at 12, 13, 14 weeks pregnant is going to be a lot easier than moving out logistically, physically, emotionally easier than trying to move out when you've got a three or four month old. This is only going to get worse. You talk about how these events, your husband getting shit face drunk, uh, those events are coming more and more frequently. And then you say, and now we're pregnant as if these are, you know, it's an inconvenient coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence at all. I don't know how long you've known your husband. You say you've only been married for a year. Well, he was keeping it together on the drinking front until at least a year ago before you married him. He managed to drink at a reasonable rate. Once you married him, and it became a little harder for you just to walk away from him, he started drinking more often. And now that you're pregnant and the idea of leaving him, separating from him is more daunting emotionally uh, and potentially logistically, the drinking is ramping up. It is only going to get worse when you are dependent on your husband really, for childcare, when you start that relay race that is parenting an infant with your husband, he's going to know that he has even more leverage and control over you then, that you'll be even more dependent on him then. Seems to me that even if you do end up salvaging a relationship here, even if you do wind up getting your husband to a place where he is sober, you're not going to get there if you don't use the leverage that you have right now. If you don't press the button that you can press right now, which is moving the fuck out. So he understands in his bones that you are not hostage 
to him because you are pregnant or because you are married to him. You know, giving your husband the benefit of a very grave doubt, maybe he's subconsciously manipulated you into this spot. Some alcoholics consciously manipulate people into these spots. Maybe it was subconscious and you're going to have to do something, something big that breaks through his denial and that gets him onto a therapist couch, gets him into AA, gets him into rehab, one or all of the above. And it seems to me you have a nuclear option. And I really think only a nuclear option, this nuclear option, you moving out right now is going to get through to him. It's going to take that kind of blast. And I'm really sorry you're going through this and it sucks. And I'm glad your sisters are there to help. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Euphoria, makers of products for amazing sex, the kind of sex you want to have. Products including arousal oil, clean lube, bath salts, and suppositories. People are literally saying things like this about Euphoria's products. This is a quote. I had a three-minute orgasm and then a five-minute orgasm and felt like I was surfing in a perpetual wave pool of pleasure. And another quote, we use Awaken, and when she gets on top, we both come so hard that we see sounds and hear colors. And it doesn't hurt when GQ calls you the best sex product of the year, and Shape says you are the best invention since the vibrator. Now, this is a little personal, but Terry and I tried the suppository and leave it to Foria to make suppositories sexy. They did it. I'm not sure what they put in there. I know there's CBD at least, but they have some serious love potion energy. So yeah, you have my permission to try this. I fully endorse you to go ahead and treat yourself to more deeper, fuller pleasure wherever you can find it as often as possible. And you can start with a bottle of Foria. Foria is offering a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first order by visiting www.foriawellness.com slash savage or use the code savage at checkout. That's F-O-R-I-A wellness.com forward slash savage for 20% off your first order. I recommend trying their Awaken Arousal Oil and Sex Oil. You'll thank me later. Hi, Dan. This is a late 30s cis woman calling from Canada. I have three young kids with my spouse, and we have been poly for about seven years. I'm calling you to talk about my partner. At the end of October, my partner of five years and I put our relationship on pause. My sex drive for any partner does that relatively common thing where it declines slowly after about two years. At first, I think it's imperceptible to my sex partners, but I can feel the shift. After two years with my partner, sex was still good, but I was less excited about it. Then about a year ago, I realized I have this submissive side that I needed to explore. I sought out doms, and at the same time, my partner and I started to explore together. It was fun at first, and he's genuinely interested in doing these activities with me. But once I started seeing an experienced dom, my interest in sex with my partner dropped away. I kept trying to be excited about him, but having sex with him started to feel like an obligation. But I kept trying, including we checked out together uh, and got memberships at a local kink space, though we didn't go to an event after that. I'm still working through some shame that I feel about what I want in the kink world and communicating with my partner about it has been a challenge. It's been so much easier to talk with someone like a dom who's just as excited, but on the other side of, of what I'd really like to do than with my partner, even though we have a good trusting relationship. The end came when we, trying to have sexual adventures together, attended our first sex party. I wasn't interested in having sex, but it was clear my partner wanted to, so I went for it. I ended up in a ball of tears on a bed in front of strangers. It was awful and felt like the death knell for our relationship. When we had the talk two days later, he said I didn't even try, especially communicating with him what was happening with me. And he said that I owed him a lot more after so long and so much. 
He reminded me that my sex drive for my spouse had also decreased with time and that after a lot of struggle for many years, we now have a sex life that we love. My partner suggested that we take six months to work on things and then decide together if it is or isn't working. And our relationship is on pause for the month of November. Dan, I wouldn't be where I am in my career without my partner. He was there when I was pregnant with our last baby and is involved with our family and good friends with my spouse. He has been this incredible force of positivity of my life. My questions are, what do I owe him and what should I do? It doesn't sound like you really want to fuck your partner anymore. And it doesn't sound like your partner is comfortable with the idea of you fucking this dom in a way that you don't fuck him, of you having this sexual interest or sexual connection with some other man who isn't your husband and isn't him and enjoying that sexual connection and these new sexual experiences. And your partner isn't able, it seems, to allow you to have that independent of him, which is all separate from the fact that there's this thing that you know about yourself that I think is true of many people, if not most people, that after a couple of years, your interest in having sex with someone who's come into your life declines. You say you can feel the shift. The sex was still good after two years, but you were less excited about it. Okay, who isn't that true of? Everybody is less excited two years into a relationship about having sex with their no longer new partner than they were at the start. But you shouldn't go through the motions endlessly forcing yourself to fuck somebody just to keep them in your life. Although I guess I've described a lot of the fucking that goes on in a lot of monogamous marriages when I describe it like that. But if going through the motions, fucking somebody who isn't your husband, who's your secondary partner, your other partner, and fucking them in ways that they know you're fucking somebody else who's also come into your life, leaves you sobbing in a heap on the floor of a sex club in front of other people, you should probably stop fucking that person. What do you owe your partner? You owe him the truth. It may be that you're still able to fuck your husband, still interested in fucking your husband, and that took some work. It doesn't follow that you owe your partner that same effort it also doesn't follow that you would necessarily be interested in making that same effort with or for your partner. So it's not a trump card that he can play, that he can point to your marriage and the fact that you still have a sexual relationship with your husband and you're somehow then obligated to make that sexual effort with him or for him, especially if you know it's not going to work. If the reason your relationship is open, if the reason your poly is – to some extent, to seek sexual fulfillment elsewhere or supplemental sexual fulfillment elsewhere. If the sexual connection runs its course with a secondary or tertiary partner, you can end it. Poly doesn't mean you endlessly add people to your collection of loves and you can never show anyone the door. Poly doesn't mean you can never break up with someone. Poly also doesn't mean that it isn't sometimes in the best interest of the person that you're breaking up with for you to break up with them, even if at the moment it is not what that person wants. If you know that this would be wasted effort, if you know that you're not interested in having sex with your partner anymore and probably never will be again, make that break permanent that's what you should do, not just for yourself, but for him too. Stop wasting his time if it's not going to work anymore. And maybe you can keep him in your life as a friend and an intimate, and you say he's woven into your family. Just because your romantic relationship ends doesn't mean necessarily that that friendship has to end or he has to be unwoven, woven out of your family life. But ultimately, that's a decision that, you know, once you've dumped him, that he gets to make for himself, whether he wants to stay in your life under these new conditions. And I keep thinking about 
<laughs> those two magic words, <laughs> informed consent. If this is something that you know about yourself, this information that you have about yourself, this insight into your character, your erotic imagination, your libido and how it works, in, is in that after two years, you've really lost interest in someone else. Stop entering into open-ended commitments with people who aren't your husband. When you meet somebody else, a new dom in your life, for instance, make it clear to them that you have an ongoing primary relationship. You are married and your other relationships, not going to be long-term, going to be short-term, but they can be successful short-term relationships that you can have a great year or two with somebody else. And then that person that you're tossing that out on the table in front of, they can make an informed decision about whether that would be all right with them, whether a year or two with you is something that they would want. And if something with a sunset clause isn't what they would want, they can choose to go date and fuck somebody else. This is Nancy, and you know that I'm a very important and very busy podcast producer, but I can't work all the time. That's where Dipsy comes in. Dipsy is your place to escape and enjoy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. It's a great way to give yourself a little erotic charge whenever you need it. Here, I'm going to read a few descriptions of the stories you could listen to. When Tara moves back to New York, it doesn't feel like home anymore. But when her neighbor Jackson starts bringing her to his favorite Brooklyn spots, she starts to fall in love with him and the city again. In a story called Lecture Me, in the days leading up to her presentation at Cambridge, Jane is hard at work practicing her delivery and won't let anything distract her. But when James shows up to support her, she finds it nearly impossible to focus. There's a ton of variety, it's inclusive, and will surely open your mind. Dipsy has stories for straight and queer listeners, and 56% of the stories are voice acted by people of color. And let me tell you, the voice actors are totally amazing. New content's released every week, so in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. They also have soothing sleep stories, wellness sessions, and sexy stories that you can read with your eyeballs. Let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind, or heat things up with a partner. It's brilliant. For listeners of the show, Dipsy's offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage makes an incredible gift. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to dipsystories.com slash savage. Dipsystories.com slash savage. Go. Go now. Dan, I'm 34. I'm married for 10 years uh, to a man, and I have a stupid problem. Okay, we're, we've been married for 10 years. I think we're both pretty GGD. And recently he has expressed an interest in uh, more ass play. That's cool. I mean, I'm down. Um, specifically, he wants to eat my ass. That's cool. I mean, it doesn't like the idea of it doesn't do a whole lot for me, but I, you know, hey, it, he's into it. Cool. So the couple times we've tried this, I have discovered that I am incredibly ticklish in my asshole. Like <laughs> this is such a stupid problem, but it's really hard to enjoy or even tolerate when the whole time I'm like tensed up, trying not to laugh and giggle and squirm away. It is so, I'm so ticklish there. I'm not a ticklish person, but like this one particular place on my body, I'm incredibly ticklish. Is there, (laughs) oh my God, this problem is so stupid. Is there any way to overcome this or like work around this? I would like to be able to allow him to do this, you know, and maybe even enjoy it. But as it stands now, it is, it is a no-go. What can I do? We both know that your butthole can be touched without you dissolving into fits of giggles because we both know, or you know, and I assume, that there are times when you touch your own butthole without dissolving into fits of giggles. You wipe yourself after you take a dump, and 
well, I assume you wipe yourself after taking a dump. I hope for your husband's sake, you wipe yourself after you take a dump. And I hope for your husband's sake, as you begin to explore analingus or eating ass, that you shower and wash your butthole when you take a shower. And your soapy fingers getting your butthole clean bear more than a passing resemblance to your husband's wet tongue when he wants to get your asshole ate or he wants to eat your asshole. So your asshole is capable of rolling with a sensation that's very like getting your asshole eaten without you laughing. Now, it's not entirely a fair or accurate or apt comparison because you can't tickle yourself. You know, your husband's tongue put someplace or your husband's finger put someplace on your body you could have a reaction to that stimulation. You can That can feel ticklish or you can be ticklish in response to your husband's touch with fingers or tongues in a way that you wouldn't be to your own touch. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the reason you can't tickle yourself is when you move a part of your own body, a part of your brain monitors the movement and anticipates the sensation that it will cause. So how do we get you to a place where your husband eating your ass doesn't tickle, doesn't make you laugh, isn't too ticklish a sensation for you to bear. Well, I think building off this information that we've gleaned from the Encyclopedia Britannica, you have to get to a place where you're anticipating the sensations that your husband's tongue might cause, at least at first, until you acclimate to this new sensation. And so what I would recommend is rather than your husband eating your ass with his face, you eat his face with your ass. The next couple of times he wants to eat your ass, he's not going to go to town on your ass. He's going to lay down and you're going to sit down on his face and just place your butthole against his mouth, against his chin, against his nose. Just like sit down on his face. Don't have him then stick his wriggling tongue out. That's definitely going to make you laugh, that's definitely going to feel ticklish for you. Just rest there on his face and then get off his face and have him stick his tongue out and then sit back down on that tongue without him moving it or wriggling it around. And then move back and forth. Drag your ass back and forth across his tongue and face. Be in control yourself of the sensations right now. Your husband eating your ass is a new and strange and intense sensation and you not being in control of it is part of why you're having this reaction, part of why it's so ticklish for you. Switch it up so you're in control of the sensation. Again, so he's not eating your ass with his mouth, you're eating his face with your ass. And then you can gradually get to a place where you're sitting your butt down on his face and his tongue is already out and then he gets to move it a little bit and take it very, very slowly. And he should be using slow, broad strokes when you get to the place where you can start moving his tongue. A lot of people who like having their asses eaten, who have a lot of experience having their asses eaten, find the sort of flicking sensation or rapid tongue movement that somebody might use and enjoy being on the receiving end of during cunnilingus against the clitoris, find that sensation too intense or too ticklish when applied to the butthole. So slow strokes with his tongue where you guys together can start to experiment with him taking a little bit of the control back from you after you get used to this new sensation by being in control of it, at least for the next, I'd say, dozen times. You guys make the attempt. Ah, bed. I've been spending a lot of time in bed lately. Not for a good reason, not for a fun reason, not even to sleep. I have that chest cold that's going around that everyone's getting, and it is nasty. And when you're in bed all day because you're sick and awake all night because you're coughing, it is a comfort, literally and figuratively, to have a Helix Sleep mattress. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. The Helix lineup offers 14 unique mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids. 
Everyone sleeps differently. That's why Helix has several different mattress models to choose from, each designed for specific sleep positions and feel preferences. I took the Helix sleep quiz with Terry and we were matched with a Midnight Luxe mattress because I wanted something that had medium firmness and Terry and I both tend to move around a lot at night, sometimes even when we're asleep. I don't even want to remember our old mattress. Good riddance to that old mattress. Not only is our new mattress, our Helix mattress, the best we've ever slept on, but the setup was fast and easy. Helix mattresses are delivered in a box straight to your door for free. Plus, Helix mattresses are American-made and come with a 10- or 15-year warranty, depending on the model. And you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. If you don't love it, I know you will, but if you don't, just hypothetically, if you don't, Helix will pick it up for you and give you a full refund. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash savage. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Let them know the Lovecast sent you. Go to helixsleep.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. I'm an ex-stripper and sex worker living in Canada. I now find myself in a totally different job that has nothing to do with sex or me being naked. And I'm just surrounded by mostly women who are extremely sexist um, and they slut shame and demean other women all day. I am finding myself really stressed out and really angry for the better part of the day every day because this is all I have to hear all day long. And I just, I need some advice as to how to deal with this environment that I'm not used to and listening to this utter bullshit without losing my mind. I would love to like open their minds and, you know, educate them on certain things or try to make them see that what they're saying is like awful, but I can't really do that without outing myself as being one of these people that they demean so harshly. Yeah, I just, I really need some advice as to how to not scream and lose my job. Ugh, it sucks. It sucks when you have to work with a bunch of shitty people who say shitty things and you are in the minority. You're the non-shitty person in a room full of shitty people saying shitty things. And you don't feel like you can push back because... You need the job. And if all of your coworkers turn on you all at once, it's going to make the job intolerable. Or, you know, if one of your coworkers is your manager, you could wind up losing your job. It's often the case in rooms full of shitty people saying shitty things, whether it's a room full of shitty people saying homophobic things or a room full of white people saying racist things or a room full of even women saying really misogynistic things that there are people sitting in that room who are gay and closeted and don't feel like they can speak up, don't feel safe speaking up or people sitting in that room full of white people saying shitty racist things who are white and not racist and don't feel safe speaking up. And of course should speak up, but it's not always possible. And women sitting in rooms full of women saying, arguably, not arguably, straight up, fucked up, sexist, slut-shaming shit about other women who are actively contributing to a culture that oppresses women, that oppresses them. Ugh. And oh my God, to be in a situation where you are the person who disagrees and is made, you know, feeling anger about the shit you're having to listen to and then feeling angry at yourself because you feel like a coward you didn't speak up, but we've all been in circumstances. We've all been in situations where the risk of speaking up was so great we couldn't run it because we needed the paycheck or we didn't feel physically safe speaking up. So I I've been there. I was in rooms where people said incredibly homophobic things even after I was out in most areas of my life. And I didn't feel safe speaking up for myself and other queer people. And I didn't because I needed the fucking paycheck or I didn't feel safe. It is a terrible feeling. And you salve that wound by committing to speaking up 
and defending yourself and defending others, defending other groups of people who may be slagged off in similar ways, whenever you can, and speaking up loudly in a way to overcompensate, to compensate or overcompensate for those times when, because you needed the paycheck or you didn't feel safe, you weren't able to speak up. So what do you do? Well, you need the paycheck. I think that's the premise of this question, the premise of this call. You need the paycheck. And you also don't feel like you can challenge all of your coworkers all at once to a throwdown about slut shaming and whore phobia and feminism and misogyny without so alienating your coworkers that your workplace becomes intolerable and or you wind up getting fired. So you're just going to have to sit there silently. Sometimes someone not participating in these conversations can make other people who are participating in these shitty conversations start to feel self-conscious about the things they're saying and doing. Because one of the things that these kinds of shitty group dynamics are grounded in or is the assumption that everyone is in agreement so we can say these shitty things in front of each other. And if someone becomes conspicuous through their silence, it can start to create cracks in that assumption that everyone is in agreement. Maybe they'll begin to think about what they're saying just based on your silence and the look you're giving them without you having to necessarily climb out on that limb and challenge them aggressively or directly. But man, man, I, 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 I feel you. The solution may be getting your resume together, finding, lining up a new job And then when you quit, explaining to the managers why, if there's HR, telling them why, that there is a toxic work environment here and that they are going to have difficulty retaining employees like you who won't put up with this shit. That may be when you get to speak up, when you've got that new job lined up. All right, before we get to this week's listener response calls, let's read some tweets. Yen Yaps tweets, Dan Savage has a great podcast. He often talks about rounding up to the one. His podcast is amazing, funny, and informative. My husband got a vasectomy because of his podcast. Hashtag Savage Lovecast. Thank you, Yen, and I'm glad your husband decided to take responsibility for his own fertility. Sarah Elizabeth tweets, as if I wasn't excited enough about hashtag spoiler alert because of hashtag Jim Parsons, I learned on hashtag Savage Lovecast that at Fake Dan Savage co-wrote the screenplay. I know what movie I'm going to for date night this week. Excited for my popcorn and icy and per Dan's advice, we are going to hashtag fuck first. Thank you very much, Sarah. I hope you hashtag enjoy hashtag the film. And finally, Brian, it's okay to be gay boy tweets. Well, I know what at Fake Dan Savage will be talking about at the top of next week's Savage Lovecast. Uh, I didn't actually talk about the story you hoped I would, Brian. The story about Joseph Harding, member of the Florida State Legislature, author of Florida's deeply shitty Don't Say Gay Bill, who was criminally indicted by the Department of Justice last week for wire fraud, money laundering, and making false statements, and then promptly resigned from the Florida House of Representatives in disgrace. To resign in disgrace, you need to be able to feel shame, which wasn't something I thought Republicans were capable of doing anymore. It was gratifying to read about Joseph Harding's downfall for all sorts of reasons. All right. Thanks to everybody who posted to your various social media platforms about the Savage Lovecast this week. It really helps spread the word about the podcast, and we appreciate your posts wherever you're posting them. And we appreciate your posts wherever you're posting them, and it really helps us find them if you use the hashtag Savage Lovecast. And now, listener response calls. Hi, Dan. I'm just calling with some feedback from the last episode. First of all, I love Dr. Ina Park so much. Every time you have her on, I just think she gives excellent, really helpful, real-world advice. I just can't stop thinking about your response to that girl who called in and had what you guys called like a really unfortunate date and and basically agreed to have sex that she didn't want to have. And while I agree that we should continue to encourage women to assert themselves in these situations and not just go along with it, and I acknowledge that you all acknowledged, you know, the patriarchal fuck shit we live with that socializes women to not feel comfortable asserting themselves with men. I was just disappointed that it also wasn't acknowledged that 
men, if you have to beg somebody to have sex with you, they are not enthusiastically consenting. You know, if a woman says she's on her period, if she says, oh, can we just make out? Don't fucking beg her to have sex with you. I'm a straight woman. I've been having, unfortunately, I've been having sex with straight men for a long time at this point. And I'm just so sick of what we let them get away with based off this narrative that they can't control themselves and their dicks and whatever. Hi, this is a listener response call for the the man in episode 841 trying to win back two of his kids. Dan, I love what you had to say. I would recommend to the caller to use the word if instead of when, as in if you are ready to talk, as opposed to when you are ready. To me, when speaks of a certain inevitability of how the process will end, and no one can say for sure. It has a certain meet them where they're at aspect to it, allows for space for the process to happen as it needs to happen. And also saying if removes any expectations that the dad may have in talking to his kids, let the process happen as it needs to, be in the moment, don't force it. To talk to my kids when they're little with their toys, if a mechanism is not functioning as it should, take the time to figure out what's wrong, don't force it, or you may end up breaking something. It works with people, too, in relationships. Let the process happen with your kids as it needs to happen. Don't force it. I'm calling in uh, response to episode 841, the young woman who said that, you know, when her ex-boyfriend dumped her, the red flag was that she was too confident. This has happened to me. Some guys, I don't know, they just have too much insecurity and they're just triggered by the fact that you are confident. Even if you were fully supportive, it is awful. It is shredding. I, you know, I just so much love and sympathy. I eventually found a guy who loved my confidence. You know, we got married. We're still together. It's worth the wait. Don't put up with this kind of bullshit. You be you, and the people who are drawn to that are stronger people. And we're going to leave it there. Got a question for next week's Lovecast or something to say about something I said on this week's Lovecast? Use the voice memo app on your phone to record your question or your comment and email it to us at q at savage.love. You can also call us at 206 302 2064. Give the gift of the Magnum subscription to the Savage Lovecast and Savage Love. It includes the extra long, more guests, no ads version of the Savage Lovecast, the Magnum Savage Lovecast, our sex and politics podcast, Savage Love live events, the Maxi Savage Love column, and more. Just go to savage.love slash subscribe and look for the Give the Gift of the Magnum link. Hey, Hump fans, from now until the end of the year, you can grab special early bird tickets for Hump's spring tour. That's a 20% discount on all tickets to any of the 23 cities Hump is coming to between February and May of next year. Go to humpfilmfest.com to grab those early bird discounted tickets now. Sale ends December 31st. Be sure to check out this week's Savage Love, where I have some advice for a single mom whose son wants her to go halvesies on a sex worker for his 19th birthday. Find my column again at savage.love slash savage love. You can still follow me on Twitter for now at fake Dan Savage, and you can follow me starting now at post.news, also at fake Dan Savage. And follow Erica Moen on Twitter at Erica Moen. The Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian, who is smart enough never to get on Twitter in the first place. And me and Nancy and the tech savvy at risk youth will all be back at you next week with another installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thank you so much for downloading.